Um, so thanks very much to the organizers. Um, um, and I'm glad to be in Japan again after four years. Our last meeting was in uh, Shikoku, indeed. Uh, so um, I would like to thank to who collaborate, uh, who contributed to this uh, presentation. And I would just like to say that I wanted to talk about the inner core originally, but then, um, you know, I, I think I made a good decision to talk about the um, the correlation wave field as well as a new paradigm in seismology because the, all the discussions and talks we had uh, a really humbling experience because I'm wondering is there anything I can teach you that you already know, don't know about the earth from seismology. So uh, you will see I guess one of the topics is the correlation wave field uh, and trying to convince you that this is a new paradigm and that potentially the way the global seismology and planetary seismology will go uh, in the years to come. Um, <clears throat> so um, I would like to convey uh, from a seismological perspective uh, that uh, the deeper, deeper interior is difficult to study because of uneven volumetric sampling, so we have to be innovative, we have to be industrious with the data that we have, and that's one uh, goal of my talk. Um, and basically I would like, if, if the time, if I have enough time to talk a little bit about the proliferation, because that's also the way uh, forward. Um, so uh, then Bill came and, and, and asked me if I could uh, possibly talk about the logmos mantle. So now I have a really ambitious talk because I would like to give you a glimpse on the Lormos mental studies as well, uh, at least from the perspective of my group, but because we are trying to answer uh, some big questions, I think, I hope this will give you a feeling of what uh, seismologists do. Um, and then uh, through the through the CODA correlation wave field and, and, uh, and the global proliferation of seismographs, uh, I, I think I will, I will conclude. So let's let's start with the inner core, uh, and uh, <clears throat> um, instead of uh, telling you what we know about the inner core, here are some of the uncertainties and challenges. Uh, and I would say uh, I don't want to give an impression an impression that we don't know much about the inner core, but uh, some of the questions that uh, still remain are some of the largest uh, uncertainties in science, not just in in, uh, in geophysics. Uh, and earth sciences, uh, and you can see some of them listed there. Um, some more specific questions are here uh, related to the shear structure of the inner core, and I will, I will demonstrate how we address this uh, with this new tool, the, the correlation wave field. Um, and uh, basically, um, I don't want to dwell too much on this, but um, Again, instead of showing you some conventional ways that seismologists work with, with you know, I could show slides of body waves and normal modes, uh, and that's how we probe the Earth. Uh, one of the, one of the, you know, the common uh, themes uh, in in uh, Earth sciences and particularly in geophysics here in my field is that we work to, uh, by using uh, inference. So. Uh, everything that we try to address is hidden deep beneath our feet and uh, typically we do that through posing the forward problem first so we have a model we can compute some parameters uh, and then we can compare it with the observations if we are happy we accept it if we are not happy then we go through another iteration and that's referred to as an inverse problem so you can do the inverse problem in a pedestrian way, but you can use more sophisticated tools, and I hope to demonstrate some of them today, especially through the Bayesian uh, inference, uh, where we also address uncertainty as an added bonus uh, to everything we do. Um, and talking about zoos, so this is our own zoo. We had a conversation uh, during the lunch uh, time, and uh, the purpose of this slide is not to uh, uh, discuss each one of these models uh, of the inner core anisotropy, so different properties in different directions uh, from the point of view of seismic waves. Uh, the point is just to 
to show you the non-uniqueness that we are dealing with. Uh, if some people who are the authors of these models were sitting in the room, I'm pretty sure they maybe wouldn't recognize their own model. So this is in a chronological order how the anisotropic um, models of the inner core um, changed. Again, the point is, uh, as the uh, famous statistician uh, here said, uh, some, uh, you know, none of these models are perfect, right? Uh, but some of them are useful. Uh, and that's what we, uh, that's the game we play uh, when, when it comes to the studies of the inner core. So what's the answer to this? I came up with this slide. Uh, again, this is from a perhaps geophysical perspective, uh, focusing on uh, global seismology, geodyna geodynamics, and high pressure mineral physics. But you can see all these other uh, fields. Um, I did include the geo geoneutrino there as well. Uh, but there are all these other tools, and in particular, uh, something that will come across my talk is mathematical geophysics that, that is really um, necessary to, to tackle all these problems that we are dealing with. Um, and here, this is to, if I can run this, uh, just to, to show you how the inner core of the Earth is seen by <clears throat> uh, seismic waves uh, that are sensitive to the inner core. The green dots here are the stations or seismographs or receivers. The red dots are large earthquakes that we can use to probe the deep interior. So we have the, uh, the inner core in the, in the center, and then on, on the right there, uh, there's a zoomed version where you can see how the compressional waves see the inner core. And while there's a, a really good coverage in the northern hemisphere, partially due to the dense networks like US Array, uh, you can see that the coverage in the southern hemisphere is rather poor. Uh, so that's making uh, things for us uh, complicated, um, that poor coverage. So how do we address that? Um, so I don't have the time to give a review on the inner core, but these are some of the, uh, I hope this is useful to point out some recent papers uh, from the seismological perspective here mostly. and. Uh, and uh, since in the last uh, five or six years, we got two books. Uh, the first one is my book on the inner core, but that's from the seismological perspective only. Uh, but just this year, uh, there's a new book by Cormier uh, and uh, Bergman and Peter Olson, uh, a bit more comprehensive view of the core. It comes with problems and, and answers, so it could be a useful tool in the classroom. Uh, and here are some of the recent topics uh, of the, on the inner core in the news. Uh, that's always busy, and you can see here uh, some um, excerpts from, from the news. Uh, super ionic structure, differential rotation of the inner core, um, ab initio experimental studies, uh, shear waves, loop-sided growth, uh, light elements, innermost inner core. All of these were present in the news uh, in the last several years. So I don't have the time to talk about all of this, but uh, let's take a look at super ionic inner core. That's a recent paper. Uh, comes from ab initio molecular dynamic simulations. They use 64 atoms. And basically, they use light elements like hydrogen and oxygen to, to find uh, shear properties of the inner core that match seismological observations. So now, one of the problems with these studies is that are uh, really First, you need to really prove what the thermodynamical sta thermodynamically stable phase of iron in the inner core is. And the game they play here is they uh, raise the temperature above the melting temperature. Then they get the drop in the, in the shear modulus. And that can explain some of the seismologically, uh, se seismological observations. Uh, but uh, the temperature is still above the melting temperature, and the inner core is not above the melting temperature. So that just illustrates one of the difficulties with, with these studies. Um, authors like Belonoshko and others have actually found the superionic inner core just from the intrinsic properties of iron, but they use the BCC iron uh, instead of HCP, as in this study. Uh, another example here is the differential rotation of the inner core. So for those of you who are non-seismologists, or uh, maybe you hear this for the first time, it was found from geo, um, uh, uh, the magnitude geodynamo simulations that uh, the inner core 
is uh, uh, differentially rotating with respect to the mantle, then seismologists kind of confirm that. Uh, but, and this particular study here focuses on um, um, some data from nuclear explosions from the Cold War era, and basically they demonstrate, um, I don't have time to go into details here, but they demonstrate that you cannot have uh, the, same si uh, the same sign of differential rotation, so the positive differential rotation or negative, but it has to be fluctuating because that's how uh, the data uh, can be observed. So, by the way, these are the, um, these are, uh, the, the seismologists basically like to look at the energy uh, direction, so where the energy is coming from, and so that's what these images are showing. Uh, and then, you know, you can use some simulations to, uh, to basically either match the observed data or show that they are, po they are, they are opposite, and that's what uh, was done here. Uh, so from there, the authors conclude that the differential rotation must be fluctuating, uh, and that sort of matches the six-year LOD um, or length, length of day variation cycle. Uh, and I couldn't help to, but, but to show as well that, that we demonstrated something like this in, back in 2013, uh, the fluctuating rotation of the uh, inner core uh, where we used basically earthquake doublets instead of, um, instead of uh, scattering of energy as, as, uh, as the author before. Uh, and it, I think it's uh, fair to point out that this is not uh, uh, there's no consensus on this, uh, so the community is still dividing, uh, divided whether uh, we can actually seismologically observe these uh, tiny signals or not. Uh, and the third example here is something that's uh, uh, becoming really popular, is the imaging of the inner core. Um, and here's an example uh, from Brett uh, and, and others uh, where they found uh, by using... Um, these so-called trans-dimensional Bayesian inversion, where trans-dimensional here means that the number of free parameters becomes a free parameter. So the number of things you don't know is one of the things you don't know. And that's basically in the inversion, uh, apart from model parameters, you can also uh, invert for the, uh, for the number of free parameters. Uh, and the good thing about it is that you don't use uh, some explicit parametrization. Uh, the parametrization is in terms of the so-called Voronoi cells. When you sum them up together, you get the mean and you get the standard deviation. And so what their results shows is that the uh, innermost inner core uh, is a little bit offset from the center in the eastern hemisphere. Um, so my group has done uh, this for the last decade or so in terms of uh, Bayesian transdimensional uh, and hierarchical inversions, where hierarchical here means that the noise in the data becomes the free parameter in the inversion itself. And that's because the noise is inherently, uh, the noise in the data is inherently related with the uncertainty, and that means with the model complexity. And so when we do these things as an added bonus, we also get the uncertainty. So. Uh, what we found here is, uh, uh, this is an example of the uh, tomography of the inner core, but just its skin, just the top 50 to 100 kilometers. And we found some correlation between uh, the attenuation, which is shown in the left, and, and the isotropic velocity structure, which, which is shown uh, on the right. Um, we think that this, uh, these images might be an evidence of the inner core convecting, but uh, this is... This is still an uh, unpublished uh, result. And these are just the uncertainties that, that I mentioned. And if you look at, for example, the right-hand side, uh, you can see the larger uncertainties in the southern hemisphere, and that's where our coverage is, is, is poor. Um, so what else have we done in the, in the, recent, uh, in the recent years? Uh, this is uh, the so-called neighborhood algorithm uh, it's a robust parameter search for the innermost inner core. Um, and what we found is that the, we confirmed uh, what was proposed at the beginning of the 2000s, in 2002, 2003, by Issy and Jomonsky, that 
uh, the inner core uh, has an inner shell, uh, the innermost inner core. Uh, it is not compositionally different from the rest of the inner core, but it has a different anisotropy. Um, and we confirmed by looking at this um, large data set, uh, which is called International Seismological Center data set, it's basically just travel times of the waves sensitive to the inner core, uh, that we confirmed that the innermost inner part uh, has a different anisotropy than the rest of the inner core. And by doing some other uh, analysis, uh, we found that the, the transition to the innermost inner core is somewhere halfway through, around 600 kilometers. Um, and then using the, um, the high quality uh, waveform data, but these are the so-called antipodal data. So you have basically a source on one side of the Earth and 180 angular degrees away you have a receiver. And by, by, by looking at some new data, and so here my colleague Satoru Tanaka from Jamstack uh, installed this very important network in Thailand, for example, which contributes to the volumetric coverage. So by looking at these new data that were previously not available, we also confirmed uh, that the innermost inner core has a pretty strong anisotropy, which is different from uh, the rest of the inner core, and the slow axis uh, of the inner core is interestingly um, uh, in, in oblique angles with, with respect to the uh, rotation axis of the Earth, right? So that's different from the outer part of the inner core where the slow axis in, is in the equatorial plane and the fast axis is uh, par parallel to the rotation axis of the Earth. Um, and perhaps uh, an independent uh, confirmation of the existence of the innermost inner core comes from the studies of uh, Werner Cormier and his group, uh, where they look at the attenuation. And of course, we have an issue in seismology. We can't distinguish between, uh, between viscoelastic and scattering attenuation. Uh, that's true not just for the inner core, but for the rest of the Earth, including the crust. Uh, but when you look at the... Um, you know, there are certain ways to, to, to address this problem. And if you look at the, what uh, Vernon and, 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 and Lee measured here, uh, there is a transition also in the queue, somewhere halfway uh, to the center of the Earth, which, which, is, uh, which could be a, um, an independent confirmation of the existence of the inner core. In terms of the lower most mantle, um, just to give you a flavor of the studies. So here we use the Bayesian tomography to uh, basically address the shear wave velocity structure in the lowermost uh, 300 kilometers of the mantle. So the shear wave models are, um, they basically match each other much better. If you look at different people's models, which, which is in different groups models, which is shown on the right, you can see that all of them look similar. But what we obtain here is a different heterogeneity spectrum. So we get a much stronger heterogeneity. So our model is shown here on the left. Uh, so you can see uh, the, you, you, you can, uh, you can uh, recognize the LLSVPs, but they look like they have an internal structure. Uh, and that's what's different from some of these other models. Uh, uh, we think that the reason why they look like they look is because they're overdamped. Um, and in the Bayesian transdimensional hierarchical approaches, you basically don't um, uh, you don't have to smooth or damp your matrix that you are inverting for. And that's one of the nice features of this type of an inversion because the uh, our um, parametrization is not explicit. So our basis functions uh, can change their shape and size and the number. And our final image is basically derived uh, as a mean of all these um, um, realizations. Um, so basically, this is what we obtain for the shear wave velocity structure. Uh, when it comes to the P wave uh, velocity structure, this one is interesting because P waves uh, or P wave models are not that similar to each other as the shear wave models. Uh, but in this study, we try to address uh, jointly the topography and the um, 
isotropic uh, velocity tomography. Uh, and what we found is that their, um, uh, their spectra, uh, if you look on the right-hand side, uh, so, the, the, uh, so the first one is basically the velocity mean, and the second one is the uh, topography in, in kilometers. Uh, so our topography is plus minus 4.5 kilometers. And if you compare the two, they're not correlated. Uh, so what that means is that uh, the, the topography is probably not controlled by isostasy, but a uh, rather dynamic uh, topography. Um, and secondly, um, you know, there was a study based on the previous um, results for topography that suggested that you need a low viscosity channel in the lower most mantle. Now, with the amplitude of topography that we are getting, you don't need such a low viscosity channel uh, in the lower most mantle, and that's just an example uh, of where this is useful. Uh, as a last example of the lower most mantle studies, uh, is something that we heard about today, ULVZs or ultra-low velocity zones. Uh, these are highly extreme seismological features uh, sitting on the top of the core. Um, they are much smaller than LLSVPs, so they are basically just a few tens of kilometers. Uh, and you have such an extreme uh, drop in the shear wave velocity uh, that can be by 50%. Uh, compared to the ambient mantle, and you have a density increase uh, to 30%. Uh, so anyway, in this study that was published earlier this year, we found that, um, and I think the first talk uh, mentioned this study already, uh, so we found that uh, through the ge geodynamic modeling with our collaborators, we found that uh, these um, the, the UL ULVZs could be really the remnants of the um, the early differentiation of the basal magma ocean. Um, okay, so no time to uh, discuss this now. Uh, so I have to move to the correlation wave field part. Um, and again, I apologize, I'll have to go through this quickly because of the time. But some of the terms I want to introduce to you is a coda, so similar like in the music. So what we do here, we in so, we, we basically get rid of the two to three hours after large earthquakes. We don't use that data at all. So what we use is over there painted in red. So basically from three to 10 hours after large earthquakes. Um, and then we basically use the cross correlation, which is basically measure of similarity. Uh, and finally, I will show you here uh, how we get these correlograms uh, as a final product, they are two-dimensional representation of the similarity uh, of the phases. And I, I hope to illustrate that this is not the same as uh, what they do with the ambient noise on the surface of the Earth, right? So where one of the basic principles of interferometry is that if you have two receivers, if you calculate the correlation for a long enough time, uh, everything cancels except the structure beneath, uh, between these two receivers. So one receiver becomes a virtual source, basically, and that's shown there on the, on the far right. So I will show you that this is not true uh, for the body waves or uh, the, the, the coda correlation wave field. Um, and uh, so what we do is uh, we benchmark everything with the numerical simulations. So we use a global network of stations and the large earthquakes, uh, maybe to uh, six uh, or even larger than that. Um, and I will show you here how this correlogram or two-dimensional rep representation is calculated. So what you do first is you take two stations, like I did here, uh, and they are 15 degrees, uh, in this particular example, 15 degrees apart. So you calculate, uh, based on one earthquake, you calculate uh, the correlation between these two stations. Uh, and then in the next step, um, basically you stack over all earthquakes, so you, uh, and all pairs that are between 15 and 16 degrees for this particular example, and you stack them together. So it's a linear sum of all these uh, uh, amplitudes of seismograms. And then you paint uh, the positive amplitude is in blue and negative in red. 
you show it uh, uh, as a stripe on the on this uh, 2D uh, representation, and then you repeat that for every single combination of receivers. And when you do that, you get uh, the uh, two-dimensional correlogram, which is shown there on the right. Um, so when we started doing this, we um, realized instantly that this is uh, uh, very similar to the uh, the existing, um, you know, travel time stacks uh, that that are used in the conventional seismology, and they are shown on on the far right there. Uh, but there are some differences, uh, in particular these um, non-causal phases or features that existed there that arrived before P waves, and so if everything is due to the uh, re the so-called reconstruction of body waves through the inter interferometry principles, then we shouldn't get those features that are shown there on the, on the far right because they appear before P waves. So to make a long story short, uh, we demonstrated by looking at the core mental boundary uh, because core mental boundary is a major boundary within the Earth. Uh, it's a more extreme than the Earth's surface. So when you do that, uh, you realize that the features that we see in the in the correlogram are basically due to the similarity of S and P waves, um, and because there is a conversion of energy on the CMB. Uh, and then, if you if you repeat that, if you look at other possible body waves that can be formed, uh, as long as they come with the same slowness to, to these two receivers, they all contribute to the correlation feature that that we observe in the correlogram. And again, to make a long story short we showed that all features in the correlogram are due to the similarity of the reverberating waves after large earthquakes. Um, and um, I will show you a few examples of how we used that. Uh, the first one was to demonstrate the solidity of the inner core uh, by finding the shear waves in the inner core. This is an 80-year-old problem. It was considered as a, as a holy grail of global seismology to, to basically convincingly demonstrate that. And so what we did in this experiment is we changed the structure in the inner core, the shear wave structure in the inner core. Uh, and then uh, you can see, uh, sorry, you can see here, if I can run this. So what happens when you change the shear wave uh, velocity structure in the inner core you, you, you change some of this uh, correlogram. Of course, in the core is less than 1% volume. So when you make this change, you wouldn't expect that many things in the correlogram change, except those that are, that are sensitive to the inner core shear velocity structure. And that's shown there on the far right uh, in this window. Uh, B, we ha you have a cusp of energy that changes in di its direction. And this becomes a method, basically, for testing the shear uh, shear wave features in the, in the inner core. And by doing that and comparing with the observations, we, we basically demonstrated that uh, there's a 2.5% reduction, reduction of inner core shear wave speed uh, with respect to the PREM model. Uh, <clears throat> and then we basically went further to first demonstrate that um, how these features are formed it's basically uh, through superposition of many seismic waves that are similar that basically contribute to that peak in the correlation function. And we, uh, we showed that each feature can be basically, um, uh, can, can be dissected to its constituents. And this is very similar to the normal mode theory in, in a way. Uh, and basically we demonstrated that what we hypothesized, how these features form, is actually true. So we can, we can uh, observe that. Um, we then demonstrated that, the, um, that you can use a single event instead of many uh, global events. You can use a single event to basically observe uh, or generate the correlogram. So this is what happened when you increase from about 100 stations to about 1,000 stations, you get a uh, much clearer here picture of the of the correlogram. So basically, one event is enough, uh, and that sort of um, proves that uh, all the features we observed in the correlograms are a result of the reverberating energy after a single event 
rather than some sort of miraculously uh, constructed body waves. Uh, and that's a long story, I, I can return to that, but I just want to show you that we demonstrated uh, that uh, we can basically make a catalog of all these features uh, and, and explain how each one of them is formed. Um, and then we can use that to, uh, so in this study we demonstrated principles how to use it in the, in the global tomography. Uh, so basically in the global tomography, uh, in order to, to use what we found about correlation wave field, you need to understand how each of these features is formed. So you need to uh, define its kernel, but it's basically doable, uh, and you can apply it to the uh, compressional wave anisotropy as well. You can, you can apply it to the uh, shear wave. Uh, um, so you can apply it to the shear wave anisotropy, uh, which, which is what we've done in this study. So you can apply it to the whole range of methods that we use in the conventional seismology. So these are just some examples. I don't have time to talk about this, but um, uh, we, in the recent work, in the recent study, we basically applied it to construct a global model of the Earth. Uh, and this model is between 15 and 50 seconds, which makes it in between PREM and AK-135. So PREM is constructed from normal modes, AK-135 from, from body waves. Um, you can use it to study the outer core structure. And last but not least, uh, we have recently showed uh, that you can replace the locations of the receivers and the sources. So that means that instead of one source, you can replace it with the receiver. And instead of many receivers, you can replace it with many sources. So what that means in practice is that you can use it in planetary seismology in the future missions to look at the interior of Mars, for example, because you can replace the inside location with the virtual source, and all the Mars quakes that we observed, you can replace them with receivers to basically uh, to, to, to study the Martian interior. So I'll skip the last uh, few uh, slides. Uh, maybe I'll show this uh, with the thank you slide. Uh, I just want to say that apart from correlation wave field, if you allow me for two more slides, uh, we need to increase our um, infrastructure of uh, instruments. And one example here is even in the locations that are really, that, are, that we consider um, uh, extreme geophysics. So one of them is the Southern Ocean. Uh, we went there uh, because uh, we went there to study large underwater earthquakes uh, that are not as associated with an active subduction. Uh, so we went there with that goal in mind, because these were, these were the largest earthquakes. We, we deployed 27 OBSs and a few more instruments on the island. We went there, and the first thing we discovered uh, is basically this. This is the, this is the Macquarie Ridge, uh, and we discovered the huge mass wasting. If you see here on the eastern flank uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this ridge, uh, hundreds, kilo, hundreds of kilometers long. So we had to instantly change our motivation to, instead of studying these earthquakes that could be tsunamigenic, now we have mass wasting that could be tsunamigenic. Um, so uh, basically, uh, I hope that in this uh, limited time I had that I uh, succeeded to convince you that the correlation wave field is a new paradigm and that we are going to use it in the years to come, uh, including the planetary missions. Um, and basically in terms of the, uh, in, in terms of general conclusions, uh, I would just say that the inner core is still in the discovery stage, uh, which is pretty much in line with other conclusions that, that, that we had. But the image we are getting is, is, is uh, still blurry, but it's getting sharper and it's basically I like to think about the inner core as a planet within our own planet that's waiting to be discovered. So thank you very much.